What's up everybody? It's Michaela with Sempaternal Healing and I am back with another video for you guys today. Before we get started, make sure that you click the subscribe button if you want to see holistic health videos, story times, some information on women's health issues, and tons of great life coaching advice. Also make sure that you're following me on Instagram because that is where you will find most of my activity and posts about new videos I'm going to make as well as useful information for you every single day. So today's video is going to be a story time. It is oh, about 6 p.m. here in Denver, Colorado, and Denver weather is so weird because yesterday it was 80 degrees, and today there has been a blizzard warning issued, and it is snowing outside. We're supposed to get anywhere from five to 10 inches tonight, um, and yeah, super bizarre, so kind of huddled up inside. It's really chilly out there, so I figured today would be a great Day for a story time video. So today's story time is going to be about something that happened to me in my childhood that I haven't really talked about. I don't really share this with very many people, but now I guess I'm sharing it with the world because I don't know, some of you may have been in a similar situation. Some of you might just be curious about this. Some of you might want to know more about me. Um, and for that reason, let's just jump right in. So when I was 13, I was like halfway through eighth grade, and I was having some pretty serious issues for somebody my age. I was dealing with a lot of depressive symptoms. I was really stressed out about school. I was getting bullied a lot, and because of that, I was just kind of really sad. Um, I was kind of in this place of why me, and just, acting out as a result of that because at age 13, I mean, you don't really know how to express your emotions. And I started actually self-harming at 13. And when my parents found out about that, they were super, super worried. I had written some really concerning things in a journal that I kept and my mother was really concerned about me. So she went through my stuff and found the journal and she ended up getting a little bit scared for me. And she, actually walked into the bathroom as I was cutting myself one night and ended up calling the police because she didn't know what to do. So the police took me to the hospital in the small town in Montana that we lived in when I was 13. And they had like an inpatient facility for juveniles where they could admit you if they had cause for concern and because of the cuts on my arms and some of the things that my mother said about some of the traumas that I was experiencing in school and with friends and stuff, they admitted me for 72 hours to an inpatient center for self-harm victims and people that were um, using drugs or stuff like that. I was with a group of people that were anywhere from 12 to 16 years old and I met a couple of really interesting friends during that time. I guess let me tell you before I jump into the rest of the story a little bit about what a juvenile inpatient center is like. The place that I went was for suicide um, and self-harm. So it wasn't like a rehab. There were people who were addicted to drugs there, but I didn't really get to interact with them because they were in a different ward in the hospital. Um, but we all ate lunch together and sometimes some of our activities were together. And essentially what it is, is they take away your personal belongings and your clothes and you have to wear scrubs and they put you in a room. Uh, usually you'll have a roommate and you will stay there for anywhere from 24 to 72 hours, sometimes way longer than that if you have really serious issues um, and they kind of figure out what to do with you. Um, and they do like groups and you watch videos and you do worksheets and stuff that kind of help you learn a little bit more about how to process your emotions successfully and you learn a lot of really healthy coping skills and this particular incident was really, really traumatic for me because 
After I was released from the inpatient facility, I did not go home. My parents decided that it would be best to send me away, um, and it wasn't like they sent me to a relative, they didn't send me overseas to some fancy boarding school. They sent me to a therapeutic boarding school, in other words, um, something that people call a program, where it's, it's for like troubled youth. So it was a boarding school facility in Yak, Montana, which is a super small, almost non-existent town, and they've got like a bar on a post office. It's like up by the border of Canada. And this place was run by a Mormon family, and they had about 20 different staff members that were always there taking care of the kids that were housed at that facility. So, I guess let me tell you guys a little bit about what exactly happened. It's sort of like me reliving past trauma here, so just give me a minute. Um, when I was still at the uh, self-harm inpatient facility, my mom came to see me for a therapy session and both of my parents ended up being there. My mother came first and she was really lovey and, and crying and I knew something was wrong, like I knew something was up and we met with the therapist and they talked to me a little bit about their feelings, I talked to them about mine and at a certain point I started to realize that that therapy session wasn't going to be the end. I had spent 72 hours in that place just wanting to go home and I was so looking forward to my parents coming to get me that I was just kind of um, excited to see them and really happy but uh, they told me at the end of the therapy session that I would be going to this therapeutic boarding school and they wouldn't be taking me home with them. So at this point I kind of started to freak out and my parents walked out of the hospital and I remember seeing them walk away as I was crying and yelling and they just closed the door and that was the last that I saw of them for five months. So basically what happened after that was they have these transporters that come and pick you up. And I went pretty willingly, but I guess sometimes what happens when transporters go to pick up troubled youth, uh, the youth will try to run or they'll still struggle and these transporters are like trained to um, essentially get you to go with them and they will restrain you, they are allowed to use handcuffs to get you in the car and I didn't really find out about that until I talked to some of the people that I met at this program that I ended up in but for me it was easy, I basically just cried the entire time, it was about a three hour drive, I was in this big passenger van and it was like this really nice couple that transported me. They got me McDonald's. Little did I know that would be the last McDonald's that I would have for a very long time. And I was asking them all of these questions, kind of just like, well, how long am I gonna be there? Like, what is it like? And the transporters don't really know anything about the program. Um, so they, they told me, you know, like it could be anywhere from a month to a year. And I kind of was just like, oh my God, like what? Because I had never been away from my parents for very long at all. Like I could barely go and sleep over at a friend's house without calling my mom to come and pick me up. Like I had some serious attachment issues as a child, like really, really bad. So when the transporters took me to this program, it was a big property with this huge, huge building on it. It was like a cabin style building and they walked me in and there was this girl on crutches that came to meet me with I think one other girl and um, the the like I forget what they call him like the manager of the program like the guy that like the head up the dude that ran the, the whole operation they were all waiting for me at the front and they took me into his office and basically did like an intake with me. They asked me a bunch of questions, they told me about what was going on, and the two girls that were there were kind of there to just introduce me to the program, and um, they were going to be the first two people that I was allowed to talk to. So that sounds a little weird, I know, but in this program there's like a level system. So when you get there, you're at like a level one, and there's level two, and I believe level three is graduate level. 
I don't really remember, but it basically goes up a few different levels. And at level one, you're not allowed to talk to anybody but level threes, so graduates. And graduates were people who kind of assisted the staff in um, helping people follow the rules, and they were like the people who had been in the program the longest. And level twos were just kind of there, kind of waiting to graduate, and depending on whether or not you got in trouble, you could like lose a level, and graduates could even lose their level. Um, so level ones basically had nothing. I think they, they took away like a lot of personal stuff. Like you were only allowed to have a certain amount of items. Uh, level twos could talk to other level twos and graduates, but level twos were never allowed to talk to level ones. And when you did have conversations, if you were a level one or a level two, you had to have something called support, which basically means that a staff member would come and sit by you while you were talking to make sure that you weren't talking about anything from your old life or talking about drugs or talking about anything that was like negative. And level threes or graduates were allowed to have unsupported conversations as they pleased. So that's a little bit about the level system. Uh, very interesting. So, I remember my first month or so there was really weird for me. I had to adjust to not only being away from my parents, but to like sleeping in quarters with other people. We had these bunk beds that there were like three or four different rooms for girls. Um, we would all sleep in bunk beds together and the boys had the other end of the hallway. This is something that's really interesting. Though this program was co-ed, meaning that there were both boys and girls in this program, girls and boys were not allowed to communicate at all. And I mean even looking at each other. Like if you, if you even looked at a boy, you could get in like really big trouble. And I don't really know necessarily like why that is. That was always so weird to me. I think it was just because they, like the other gender was like a distraction from you you know, becoming a better person or whatever, doing the work on yourself, like working on yourself. Um, so yeah, that was really weird, but lots of adjustments. I, I think for the first month, I basically just like sat around and cried. <laughs> like that was really all that I did. Um, we had a therapist there that would do sessions with us every week or sometimes twice a week. She would do individual sessions and basically really try to get to the root of our issues. This therapist was a hard ass. <laughs> like, she was really, really cool and by far the best therapist I've ever had. She was so communicative and just very knowledgeable and very grounded in herself. Um, so we would have individual therapy sessions and then we would have girls group therapy sessions and those were the best. We would all just go into the therapist's office, which was like a five by six room with a desk and some couches, and we would all just like huddle around like on the floor. And we would talk about, you know, our, our troubles and some things that were going on in the girls' group that, um, like issues we were having with each other. And it's a weird dynamic, you know, what happens when you're in a therapeutic boarding school and you're living with all these other girls. like. There can be drama, but like only so much because you're like supported in conversation and you know, it's interesting how when you're living together and you're all working on yourselves in a way that's supposed to be so transformational, like you feed off of each other. And when one person gets down or is struggling, everybody can struggle. And I'm gonna talk about that uh, here in a little bit. There's a preface to what I'm about to say about the girls group and their struggles. So you might be wondering what happens when you get in trouble. I know that I've mentioned there are a lot of things that you could get in trouble for. So this is where things start to get a little weird. This therapeutic boarding school thing that I went to, it was only helpful to an extent. I feel like it did help me, it did change my life, but some of their practices were highly unethical and towed the line of legality. So when you got in trouble, what would happen is you would be on something called LOGP. Now I don't remember what exactly that stands for, but basically you would take a chair 
and you would face the chair directly at the wall inches from it and you would sit in that chair until they told you that you could get up. Usually LOGP lasted for 24 hours. Sometimes it lasted for three days. Or you would be put on something called solo if you were doing really bad. And a solo was basically, you would be on LOGP facing the wall in a chair, not able to talk to anybody, hardly even staff, until they decided that you were ready to return to the group. So it's really interesting because the, the group, like girls and guys as a whole, we all had um, like a common space, like a living area that we would all sit in. We had like, it was like a cafeteria style place. The girls would be on one side, the boys would be on the other side, and only graduates were allowed to sit facing the boys or graduate boys allowed to sit facing the girls. Everybody else had to have their backs turned to the opposite gender and we weren't allowed to even look at them, which was so weird. And then like along the walls, you would have like people who were on LOGP. And back to what I was saying earlier about like the whole group struggling as a whole, you would have group solo. If the entire group was doing really, really badly, like everybody was struggling, people were having drama, people were starting fights, like it would be group solo. And basically the entire group, like 15 to 20 girls, would all have to face the wall. Nobody was allowed to communicate. We would have like essays to write or worksheets to do, but nobody was allowed to communicate. And it happened one time where both the boys group and the girls group all got on solo. And I think it lasted for 15 days total. We would be taken off of solo like one at a time. Um, but it was so interesting because I remember like everybody just like sitting and writing and just silence. Like it was so quiet and there were so many people in that room at a time. It was so bizarre. So that's a little bit about the punishment side of things. Um, for school, we had independent study. So we would take like college or high school slash college credit classes independently and just work at our own pace. So I am a really good independent learner. Like I learn really, really fast and I focus. And in a place like that, where you kind of just want to escape your reality, schoolwork was my thing. Like I did it all day, every day. And I learned so much. And this is what was hard for me, was that I went into this program in the middle of eighth grade. I stayed there for an entire year. At the end of that year, when I left the program, I had enough credits to be in the middle of 10th grade. So when I returned to regular high school, I was in 10th grade. I had missed the freshman year. I was bounds ahead of people that I had been in class with before. My parents put me in a different school, but it was so weird just like socially, you know, like, like as you grow up, especially in adolescence, you know, you, you reach certain social milestones and I didn't really have that. So I had to catch up really fast and it was super stressful for me. Granted, I was always a little bit ahead of my time. I was always mature for my age, but it was still really weird for me because everybody was significantly older than me and I would be like making friends and you know eating lunch with people that were like a couple years older than me and it was just like it was what it was you know everybody was like having sex and I had girlfriends and all this stuff and I was like like what the heck is going on so yeah but back to the program um, Another thing that we did was, um, it was called Circle PC, Circle, Circle PC, uh, which stands for physical conditioning. We had this awesome, <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome staff member at this program. He was inspirational and a lot of people hated him, but he ran Circle PC. And basically what Circle PC was, was that you would get in a circle with the entire group and you would do like military drills, essentially. And you couldn't stop. Like if you gave up or you stopped, like you could risk getting in really big trouble and like having to 
face away from the group, go on LGP, like face the wall, and people just didn't want that. But a lot of people struggle because, I mean, there's like a mental battle that you go through working out, no matter what kind of workout you're doing. Uh, but the staff member that led the Circle PC was so good about like being like a drill sergeant. And every time that I work out, like even to this day, if I feel like giving up or I'm like struggling to complete like a final rep of weightlifting, like I'll hear his voice in my head just like yelling at me. <laughs> it's so weird. But um, in addition to Circle PC, we would run hills and we would run a, um, a three, three miles, I think it was, three miles every Monday, just up and down the driveway. And um, these hills that we would have to run, it wasn't really a hill. It was basically like, um, you know how like when the ground, when there's like a, like a ledge and the ground starts to give way and dirt will like roll down and like it just kind of collapses and crumbles. It was like a big giant ledge that was made of dirt that had like roots that you could grab on to get to the top. And granted, you could run around. There was like a way to get up that was just a hill, but most people just like wanted to go like straight up and I got really good at that. So um, another thing that we would do, uh, work projects. So these work projects could be anything from cutting and getting firewood to the lodge, um, which is what we called our main building. Uh, but my favorite one was the community garden that we built. From scratch, we created an entire community garden and it was amazing. It was so fun for me because we had to put these big logs in the ground to create a, a really tall perimeter fence so that deer couldn't get in and eat any of the produce. Um, we had to like dig like four to five feet into the ground in order for the logs to be put in place. And the boys group actually went and got the logs like from the forest and they like cut, cut it down and um, like cut it to size. And my favorite thing was digging, digging the holes. I could build a three foot wide and five foot deep hole in about two hours. <laughs> And that was my greatest accomplishment as a juvenile. That was like the best accomplishment for me. Um, so, you know, I, I was there for about four months before I reached graduate level. And when you're a graduate, you uh, get to see your parents and your parents will take you away from the property for a visit. And that's that, that first visit that you have after your graduation ceremony to level three, um, like all the parents will come and they'll have like this big like commencement ceremony to like celebrate your progress in the program. And then your parents will take you off site for I think it was like two or three days. Um, and then after that initial visit, you would be in contact with your parents more and more and you would go for home visits and um, like offsite visits. Your parents could like come and take you whenever they wanted to um, with therapist approval. And you would kind of just slowly get integrated back into life. Um, and I graduated at four months, which was super unusual. Usually it was six months before people graduated, but I kind of faked my way through a lot of that program. And because of that, about eight months in, I lost my graduate privileges and was put back down to a level two. Um, I don't really remember why. I was just doing like really bad stuff, just like influencing people badly and just like being like a bad person altogether. Um, so they were going to actually extend my program time to like 14 months but um, at the home visit um, at my 12 month mark I like convinced my mom to let me stay home um, and so they pulled me out of the program um, I met a lot of really really amazing people there people that I still talk to to this day people that are a huge 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 part of my life and I would not be the person I am today without them staff included and people from the boys group as well um, unfortunately a few of my really, really, really good friends from that boys group have passed away in the last few years. And even though you weren't allowed to talk to the boys when you were living, you know, at the program, you kind of come out of that with common understanding and, you know, the ability to draw inspiration from one another in a, in a really unique way. And after I left the program, I talked to a lot of those guys and we became really close. And 
two of the ones that I was the closest with passed away um, from returning to some of the habits that got them put in that program in the first place, which doesn't really give me a lot of faith in the program. But I did learn some things there. I definitely learned how to push myself through a workout. I, you know, feel like I conquered something. And um, when I returned to high school, it was the start of a absolutely tumultuous juvenile career. I was a hellion uh, in my later teen years. Absolutely a hellion. But that's a story for a different time. So <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed this. Give this a like if you uh, had a good time watching it or if you can relate to anything in this video or if you yourself went to a program. I would love to hear about it. So leave a comment in the comment box below. And um, yeah, I will catch you guys next time.